see so many of you in the room. It's a real sign of the uptick in MA activity that we're seeing in Egypt. Now, for the next 45 to 50 minutes, my panelists and I will be talking about what we deem to be one of the most exciting sectors when it comes to M&A activity over the next couple of years. We're going to be talking about health and education and we've assembled a fantastic panel to help us discuss the topic. Um, however, I, I'm keen to make the most of the opportunity of you guys being here as well. So if there are any questions that you have for the panel in its entirety or individual panelists, please make sure to make a note of them and there will be plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the session. With that, let's get started. Jeremy, can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you fit into the conversation around education and healthcare? So hello everyone, my name is Jeremy Panacheral. I'm a partner with EY Parthenon and I lead our strategic services in the healthcare and education markets in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, so what that means is we help clients with their growth agenda, with M&A and a variety of different equity building propositions. Um, I've been in the market for 10 years, uh, really focused on healthcare and education. I would say half of my clients are financial investors. The other half are uh, operators, uh, like one of my co-panelists here. And uh, looking forward to uh, talking about that further. Brilliant, thank you very much. And then we've been joined by Gary. Gary, can you tell the audience about yourself and how you fit into the conversation? Uh, yes, I'm the, uh, I'm the head of uh, Altamimi & Co's corporate commercial practice. Um, and so we sort of operate that practice in nine countries across the region. Um, I myself sit in Dubai. Um, and uh, we've, uh, at the last four or five years, we've basically found that, uh, that healthcare and also education have been particularly hot sectors, both for M&A and, uh, and capital market fundraisings. Uh, and so uh, but it, we've found that a very interesting industry to work in and we've put more resources into it recently for that reason. Okay, fantastic. Now, it's obviously lovely to have advisors sitting on the panel, but I'm particularly excited to have Mohammed here because you're obviously directly in the market. Mohammed, tell us about yourself and the company that you're associated with, and then we'll get to the last panelist after you. My name is Mohammed Al Qalla, I'm CEO of Sira. Uh, we re recently just listed in the market in the middle of uh, very muddy waters, but I think we managed to do the dive quite well. Uh, we've been in education for the past 25 years. We're actually Egypt's largest investor into private education. Uh, and we have a lot of stories to tell about how this industry actually works and what's the prospectus for us. So excited to be here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And then Mahmoud, can you tell us about yourself, please? Um, my name is Mahmoud Salim. I am the head of investment banking at HC Securities and Investment. Uh, I have been, I have advised a few clients on transactions in the healthcare in, uh, in Egypt and uh, uh, some of them have been local companies, some regional companies. Okay, fantastic. We're going to get to talk about who some of the key players in the, in the space in this area are. Now, um, I'd like to start off, when we had the, for every panel that we have at these events, we do a pre-call and we get to talk to the panelists about, you know, why we're going to talk about this topic, what we think is interesting, what kind of areas we need to touch on. And immediately on the call, I think, Jeremy, it was you that said, well, actually, yes, we recognize it's a hot sector, but if you actually look at the amount of deal activity that we're seeing there, we're not actually seeing that reflected. So talk to me initially about why you feel it is such a hot sector and why so many firms that we're seeing on the advisory side are throwing additional resources at it. And then let's also explore why this um, obviously apparent attractiveness of the sector is not actually translating into deal flow. So I wake up every morning uh probably more paranoid and cynical than most people would ever want. <clears throat> I don't actually think the sector is hot. I think it's good. It's not hot. If you read the press, everybody will sell you on the idea that it is genuinely hot. But the data doesn't show that. I think what has happened over the last five years across the MENA region and across Africa is a recognition from financial investors that these sectors which are inherently defensive and therefore have attractive attributes for certain types of <clears throat> investors or operators is worth investing in. At the same time, and we had this conversation, Mohammed and I did uh, earlier on, if I think about in both of those sectors, but especially uh, in very different ways, over the next five years, it's, it's really about being more creative and innovative on how you think about the sector the segments within the sector you play in, 
and how you actually execute against that. So I think some of the easy money has been made already, not much, but some. Uh, you know, folks like Sira have uh, done incredibly well, right, with this uh, listing, uh, and that's created some positive sentiment and some confidence. But I think, on the whole, it's, uh, it's still a very uh, new in asset class, if I, if I th really think about it, and it's going to change. If I think about a few different trends that will be, uh, in my view, uh, essential for investors to think about, the first is think of both healthcare and education from a segment point of view. They're big spaces, pick your spots, be good at whatever you decide you're going to do. The returns are very different within each of the segments within healthcare and education. Uh, second is, I think these are essentially infrastructure businesses. And over the last five years, uh, we've seen investors being able to look at the PropCo returns separately from the OPCO returns. We've never had an opportunity to really deploy capital with a recognition of those different disparate parts of these uh, essentially defensive industries. And I think increasingly that becomes an opportunity. The third is, um, you know, you, you, you tend to have operators and investors who stay very close to markets that they're comfortable with. And in that sense, that's good. But I think folks like Syrah and GEMS and various others, uh, if you look at NMC, for example, on the healthcare side, the bold have decided to think beyond their comfort zones. And when they've done that, and if they've done it properly, uh, they have created and generated equity value. I'll stop there. I could talk in endlessly about this. Stop, stop there because there's a couple of points that we'll come back to. But before we move away from that, I'd, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper about why we're not seeing that investment. Because from a demographic point of view, education and healthcare should be two areas that should be booming. If you think about sort of the age of the average population in some of the emerging markets, it should be. If you also think about the rise of the middle class and the disposable income that we're seeing, that should actually be invested in healthcare. So why is that not happening? Why do you, on the one hand, have the demographics shouting out, yes, these are sectors that should be hot, but on the other hand, that investment not coming through? The simplest way I can answer that question is this. And again, we're talking about healthcare and education. Whilst in our region we tend to think about them similarly, they're actually very, very, very different, right? But the simplest way I'll do this, if you, if you think of healthcare, you have a patient, a payer, and a provider. If I use that exact same lens for education, you also have a student, a payer, in some cases it's a government payer or a private payer, and a provider. What we've historically focused on is providing. The key dynamic that really needs to be paid attention to is the payer dynamics. Affordability is the biggest issue. So you're absolutely right, the demographic uh, potential, and if you think about it from Egypt's point of view, it's unbelievably compelling. If you look at the demographic dividend opportunity in Africa, statistically, it's unbelievable. But how do you actually access that? And I think the key increasingly is focusing on being able to deliver good outcomes for the right price. In both healthcare and education, a lot of money has been made by creating the infrastructure to provide care, to provide education, and the initial money has been made on the higher end of the payment cycle. But the people actually need it across multiple levels and for multiple needs as well. So I think the days of just focusing on making money from the provision of healthcare and education is changing. It's very much about trying to figure out how to align all of those, focus on the segments that make sense, move into new markets that create that opportunity, and I think that's much harder work uh, than the alternative. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to bring in Gary Mahmood. Talk to us about your clients. Where do they come from? What are their sort of deal drivers that push them into saying, you know what, these will become areas of investment for us? How much of it is it actually a long-term plan that they're, that they're talking about? Um, I'm, Jeremy spoke about, you know, you need to look five years into the future. How much of this is something where they say, you know what, we want to get our foot into the door right now with a long-term plan, with a long-term vision? And how much is it something where they say, we want to make an investment right now and we want to see returns on that investment within the next couple of years? Mahmoud, maybe first you. Uh, let me first start by saying uh, healthcare and education are, uh, there is real demand in the markets. They are no, not luxury, they are necessities. 
and there is real demand in the market first because the markets are underserved in terms of uh, number, for example, of hospitals, beds, uh, schools, occupancy is very high. And second, there is a demand for better quality because in both healthcare and education, quality is, is important. And you don't have a lot of choices. It's regulated markets and the regulator has to take into consideration not just providing the, the service, but also the quality of the service provided. So there is demand, uh, but looking at the market, as you said, demographics, for example, being 100 million population, this means there is a lot of demand. I don't think this is completely uh, accurate because our market is not, I, I don't see it as one market. It's, there is a market who can afford for for the services and there is a market who cannot afford for the services so when it comes for example for international schools in Egypt I cannot say we are a hundred million population so there will be demand and people come and invest and open schools and it's, it's different uh, I think the, the markets needs to be segmented especially in the education uh, education space uh, on the healthcare side demand is, is more clear and I think it's more open to uh, investments from the private sector. Uh, still most of the Egyptians or the majority of the, Egypt, of the Egyptians is paying for their healthcare service, services in Egypt, more than 50%. The government is only paying less than 50%, which is, uh, which is for a poor country, it should be the other way around. And the government is trying to implement or have actually announced a program, a universal healthcare program that, will, that started this year and will extend to 2032, which should cover uh, more 100% of, of uh, the population. The demand we have seen, I, I haven't seen a lot of demand in, for especially M&A in, in the education sector, but what I know is there is a lot of investments going, especially in the middle class segments, schools, uh, 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 K-12 schools and uh, uh, schools directed for middle income, it's opening every day. So there is uh, investments going, but I'd say mostly coming from inside the country, not coming from foreign uh, investors. Uh, and I think it's partially because of the regulations, local know-how in dealing with such sectors, especially on the education, is important and I think local investor have local investors have the more experience in dealing with it. It's it's uh, they have been in the market probably with smaller entities for a long time. So they, they know how to deal when it comes to uh, how to deal with uh, financials and uh, fees and uh, and those things with which is regulated. On on the healthcare I, we have seen more investments coming from abroad. I'd say in the pharma sector there have been some uh, acquisitions 10 years ago it was more than 10, 15 years ago and 10 years ago it, the appetite or the activity of financial investors and private equities more, was more it is still there it's on the top uh, of their list when it comes to sectors but the most of the uh, acquisitions I'd say the good acquisitions have been done by uh, strategic companies like Hekma, Tabuk, uh, those companies, I, I, I think they have done most of the acquisitions in, uh, in the past. And I say also private equities uh, have not, some of them have not, we always remember who have made money, but we, uh, we, we, we forgot who have lost money or who is still stuck after 12 or 15 years in an investment and he cannot exit and he, he changes advisor every and do a process every two years. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gary. Do you want to uh, shed some light on sort of your perspective when it comes to what your clients are working on, what they're looking at and what's driven them into this particular space? Yeah, well, I, think, I think to begin with, um, uh, I'm just a little bit uncomfortable now because I'm a, I'm a lot um, more cautiously optimistic than Jeremy is. <laughs> And he's an industry expert, so I, I should defer to him. But it, what he said about healthcare being a defensive sector does not at all align with what we're seeing in, in terms of how our clients view things and things that have been happening on the ground. 
Um, and most of the most of the transaction we've been involved in, a lot of it we've been we've got a sort of two-track um, involvement in the sense that there's been a lot of interesting big strategic moves that people are doing, you know, with a, with a view to sort of really uh, rolling out not only infrastructure but also all the surrounding um, uh, supporting services that go about it. For example, you start with an anchor hospital and then you acquire a whole bunch of clinics uh, to serve as a catchment to feed your hospital. You know, that, and that's, that's very aggressive strategic moves. And are those clients of yours that are do, pursuing that sort of strategy, are they people locally or is it international firms coming in, recognising the opportunity here and wanting to get a foothold early on? Well, it's, actu it's actually a mix. So if you look at stuff in the UAE market, which I'm most familiar with, we've, you know, we've had two listings on the London Stock Exchange of, of healthcare companies, which is big, quite sizable listings, which is NMC, which was a, a listing in London, which had a lot of foreign investment. Which uh, is today a FTSE 100 company, right? Yeah. An exceptionally great story. Uh, and and we've also and which, unfortunately, we didn't get the legal fees on that, but uh, but we did do the Al Noor uh, listing on London Stock Exchange, which was basically a hospital asset based in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we were also on the sell side recently when NMC made a very sizable 500 million dollar US dollar acquisition. Uh, of, uh, uh, Al Zara Hospital in Sharjah, uh, and and so what we're seeing is people really trying to position themselves strategically and sort of some large plays. <clears throat> and on the on the lower tier, we've got a whole bunch of people coming to us for help in all the intricate, tricky red tape that goes around medical regulation and all the way the licences are held, and they'll only give licences to flesh and blood people and all this sort of thing, and we have to navigate all these things and explain them to the UK listing authority, which isn't easy. Um, having said all that, I, I basically don't think, if, if you define healthcare widely, I don't see it as a defensive sector. I'm not an industry expert, I'm just a lawyer, because of the fact that um, healthcare expenditure is just going to continue to rise everywhere. And, and we're still, a long, in this region, a long way behind world sort of benchmarks of what they're spending in Europe and, and all that. And there's a lot of government policy tailwinds pushing more money into the sector. Um, I'm talk referring to compulsory insurance. Um, and, and particularly in the Gulf countries, the government's also sort of under, underwrite Mercedes-level health care for their own nationals. So, yeah, I, I'm probably wildly optimistic, but... <laughs> Well, watch this space. Um, Mohammed, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Obviously, you are one of the, the success stories when it comes to the education space. Tell us about sort of the attractiveness that you see in the sector and then also sticking with this theme of investors coming into it. How much competition do you feel yourself under or are you actually so established in the market that it's going to be difficult to unseat you? Uh, that's definitely a good question, but I mean... Let me try to reiterate some of the stuff that have been said here and also jump to a point. And I think the first thing when it comes to, and I'll focus on education because this is where I really know what I'm doing, is there's a lot of education that needs to be done on the side of the educators and operators as well as the side of the PEs working in this business. Our experience over the can, past Can years, I just interrupt you? You mentioned PE. I mean, is this, is this a PE play? Is this, this sector and, and, actually something and this, where... And this, this is I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. So basically... We started our journey almost 10 years ago. Whether we're working with DFIs or the likes of Abraj or now with the market, there have all, and even with the regulators themselves, in this part of the world, there is a lot of lack of knowledge of how can you match this industry with the current financial patterns and financial norms that's going around. There is a lot of education on both sides. You have to realize that governance becomes the biggest issue. Why? Because all around this region, most of the ownership within even healthcare and education is strictly classical family-owned businesses. These are families who got used to very high returns, positive cash flows, people have been sitting on heaps of cash, they knew their game quite well, and for them to move to the next step, there have to be a lot of derivatives moving forward. And for them, a derivative is not an interesting five years plan or an expansion plan, because you can see forward. It's not easy to tempt them to move forward because it's a very comfortable position. And then once you even get them to move forward, you get hit with the governance structure. Because at the end of the day, education, and I want to recite this, it's not a nice building, it's not content, it's not access, it's human-to-human -human interaction. You have to realize this is one of the highest human-to-human -human interaction businesses in the world. On every day, 
your existing on human to human relationship with your client, with your regulator, with your community. So the main wealth here is the ability of management to exist in high intensive human interaction on daily basis, and this is insane. Think of yourself, you wake up in the morning, and I'm just, I'll just try to switch the seat here. You wake up in the morning, since 5 a.m., and uh, if you have a family, you have one kid going on the road to school, you're a bit worried, are they going to arrive, did he arrive safe? Think this will be in the thousands. And then you continue the day with every single student in every single place, there is a, a risk of an injury, of a problem, of a complaint, and then when this gets multiplied by the thousands, it becomes a much, much larger platform to take care of. And then at the end of the day, you deliver everybody back home. This happens in high ed, this happens in K-12, to it happens everywhere. This is the wealth of the operator. And this is the value. I think that's one of the main areas that people need to take a look at. The problem is a lot of people now are talking about the infrastructure, the assets, the numbers, but that's the core. If you get a babysitter to your home, you dwell a lot of time to think about who's going to come and spend a few hours. Think of who's going to spend the whole life of your kids. Probably they see them much more than families do. And that's why this element of relationship, of reputation, of trust, of human-to-human -human interaction is what you're effectively buying into. This knowledge is still not shared between both sides because at the end of the day, you see people sitting on both sides of the table and the discussion becomes how expensive is this building, how many schools you're going to roll out, how many faculties, how many are going to graduate, what's the hike, and it doesn't happen this way. It's a bit more complicated than that. So I think on the side of, it, it's very important. We have to always stress on this point. And that's why I think a lot of deals are not really moving because the two sides don't see the same picture. That's one. If you follow that through, then really education is something where we, we should never see these massive organizations, but actually we should see smaller family-owned businesses staying in control. Because in that case, you, I mean, it's, it's difficult to see if you're running, you know, 30, 40 schools with thousands of children, how are you ever going to ensure that human-to-human -human interaction? Whereas obviously, if you run an individual school and you're on site the entire time, you can build up that relationship. And here comes the second part. Because that's a system and a knowledge that you build through the years, so look at the models we've seen in Latin America, for example. When, when somebody would come tomorrow and tell you, I have two successful schools, I'm going to roll, roll out 50 in the next five years. That's a, a train to doom, and I'm telling you that. Because it comes after time. Like, like, for example, what Sira did, and I think was very successful, every five years we kind of up our growth patterns in a very realized way. So is this an industry where you on cheat, you can see this growing very fast? Yes. Would this actually happen on ground? You have to be cautious about this component. So it's a very defensive industry, amazing cash flow cycle, but growth have to be done within the limits of the industry itself rather than do it on a piece of paper. So I just want to be also very blunt on this. And, and that's a very important point to differentiate. It's not as easy as we can roll it out. It's doable and it's growing. But Latin America, South Africa, when you move from X to 10X, you started having problems. You move from X to 2 to 3X, yes, it can be done. So, as I say, it's an industry of sustainable growth. Jeremy, I see you itching over there, wanting to continue. <laughs> no, I agree completely uh, uh, with what Mohammed just now said. What I alluded to earlier on, where I said I don't think the market is necessarily hot, wasn't to suggest it's not attractive. It's very attractive. But it's attractive in the way that Mohammed said. I think the opportunity to take a traditional private equity focus, certainly to ed K-12 education, is very limited. It actually lends itself much more to permanent capital, very strong operators, and a separation of property and operating returns. That's K-12. In healthcare, right, to the point that was made earlier on, if you have a significant hospital network, actually you would be relatively naive to add more hospitals. In fact, what you should do is create an ecosystem of clinics, referrals, and so on, that allow you to differentiate and diversify the risk that you have on a single hospital, right? So if you took, think about it, even though NMC acquired Al-Zahra in Sharjah, which was a, a hospital acquisition, some of their most recent uh, investments have been in IVF, for example, right? And therefore, creating a differentiated proposition. I think organizations like CIRA or GEMS, and so on and so forth, uh, really have to think about segments within education that provide more value for them and become really good at operating within those segments. 
if you look at the way I think a lot of investors will have to think over the next five years is to really think about the different challenges in uh, working within certain segments and what are the different uh, returns profiles within that. So if you look at it, Sierra with a nice 20% pop post IPO, I think what, 22 times EBITDA now? Yes, super impressive, right? And I say congratulations for that because it creates a lot of positive sentiment. At the same time, there's very few listed K-12 school groups globally, right? Nord Anglia delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. Cognita didn't do a listing. They got sold to Jacobs Holdings. Um, there's a couple, Kuro, for example, in South Africa, but not a lot. But there are a lot of listed education businesses that aren't K-12. University businesses, ed tech businesses, and when you look at the valuation differences, they're extraordinarily varied, right? So if you look at the largest 15 Chinese listed education companies, this is a highly regulated market, right? Trust me, when China deregulates it, you will hear a big sucking sound, right? Which is every teacher in the world going to China, right? Which, which creates a lot of challenge for what we have to do here, right? But if you talk about compelling demographics, there's nothing like China, right? And the reason why we have such a large private education market here, especially in the GCC, is because it's not as regulated as China is, right? And as soon as they deregulate, you'll, you'll see that difference. If you look at the 15 largest listed education businesses in China, they have an aggregate market capitalization of close to $50 billion, right? Yet, if you look at our region, with the few exceptions, like Syrah, <laughs> There's very few that have done that. Gems postponed their IPO, right? So I think anyone who's really thinking about MENA markets and African markets really have to pick their spots, develop really strong operating capabilities, and don't think about home running. Can I just add? Yes, now, on the, on the second point, now I was just going over the kosher spot. Now, the interesting part is if you take a look at Egypt now, do you, you know how many students we have in grade 12? It's 820,000 students. At kindergarten one, we have 2.2 million. So Egypt's population pyramid is crazy when it comes to education. So is there a market? There is a massive market. And, and the, the question when we invest is never, is it going to succeed? No, it's about when is it going to get returns. So it's always a guaranteed investment going forward, and there's always a demand. But here's come the interesting part. Which, like you exactly mentioned, which demographics are you really targeting? If you take a look at the segment all over the region, specifically in Egypt, the focus have to be on the middle class. Most of the private sector investment, even with families, happen in the boutique line, which why it's a, the deals with one to the three percent. It's one to two schools, deals with the rich, caters to the rich, and it's always about the image of the family and the image of the founders. But the biggest demand in this country, and, it's, and what's happening and appearing now in Saudi and what we're seeing happening in the UAE with, all, with the restructuring is, it's the middle class that's lost in the middle. With the current economic conditions, they cannot afford the boutique service, and by all means, they don't want the government service. So that's the class that is highly in need of rolling out investments and rolling out service. And we talk about middle class in this part of the world, we're talking about probably 100 million combined between all the countries. So it's outstanding in terms of demand. The question becomes, how can we roll what is needed rather than what I personally perceive is my level of education? So you enter schools and investments, and I've seen a lot of this with PEs, including some we even worked with before. You have all of these new schools with swimming pools and activities and facilities and cafeterias. Is this what's needed now? No. What is needed is decent campuses done with proper equity with base security, but gives as much education as you can, because that's a demand in the market. Middle class educated generations. But nobody's focusing on this now. And that's why I think Sierra had ample opportunity to grow within this sector, because simply no one was really focusing. So everybody, I, mean, I said, whenever I open a school, and everybody said, why do you open the school for 12, 13,000 Egyptian pounds? Can't you do a school that is for 150? I said, I can do 150. I said, why don't you do it? And I said, because there is how many people can pay the 150 in the next three to five years. And during the financial crisis, the first thing people did is trying to look at the level below when it comes to education. Because in this part of the world, education, healthcare 
effectively constitute 50% of your actual income. Think of how much you pay to your kids at school, how much you pay for your healthcare, a bit of entertainment, and we'll, that's probably most of what you make around the year. Mohammed, so, if, if I could just interrupt you. One of the things that I'd like to get out of this conversation is how much of these education and healthcare needs will be able to be satisfied by local players and how much is this something where we are going to see international players coming in? Because there are obviously operators who are successful in other parts of the, of the world. How much will they be able to get a, a, a part of the market share or how much is this actually something that is going to be solved by Egyptian suppliers and providers? Here's the interesting part. So when we're talking about the global operators, Take a look at the average tuition fees in most people around the world. How many global operators that you know would charge $600? So that's always the equation. That we have seen the likes of global operators moving into the market, but by merit of income, they always move into higher segment. So uh, un unless, they, unless they manage to link with a local play and open this branch of affordability, it, it won't work. So I think the best bet for local or global operators is to try to find the proper local player upgrade the game, add in a bit of their management savviness and try to get them to scale down. But operating directly, once you have a single expat moving into a school, you move into a different bracket market. And, and so, so that's why I think there's gonna be a limitation. The space at, at the top line is, is almost getting filled up. So we know a lot of schools within this top one to 3% are operating at 40 and 50% utilization. But if you take a look at the middle segment, we're talking about 125% utilization. So, so, so that's it. So local operators need to keep an open mind, an open view. We're even in discussions with a couple of them now. A lot of them are interested in this whole new R&D component, how I can make sure that my educational facilities can go into a lower segment. So if they get out of their comfort zone and think of affordability, yes, Egypt becomes a massive playground. If they stay within, then they miss the market. Mahmoud and Gary, can I bring you in? Obviously, Jeremy and Mohammed have made a number of interesting points that I feel anyone wanting to enter the market will need to consider. How much are these points that you've heard and you've spoken about in your conversation with your clients that are potentially interested in entering the market? And how much are these things that you're like, actually, those aren't things that we've considered or our clients are actually actively considering? I think for international uh, players in the school, in the school space or to come to Egypt to operate independently and roll out schools, I don't think we will see it. I think the development of the th sector will come mainly from the government and the existing local players. Uh, potentially, if we want to, to uh, increase the uh, contribution of the private sector, we shouldn't be waiting for foreigners to come. The maximum that will happen <coughs> is some financial investors or as Mohammed said uh, one of the big players he will come to either to invest in an existing company provide them with uh, funding to to expand or have a partnership but we will not see a lot of contribution coming internationally the government can expand they have some ideas about PPP projects to open more schools because the government understand the there is school schools a lot of schools needed but of course, the government is, is focus is mainly decreasing the capacity in classes, opening schools in new areas, but the focus on quality is, is a bit a uh, higher shift which comes to the private sector responsibility and most of the cases worldwide, the government, because Egypt is also not different, the government is a big player everywhere in, in, in the education. Uh, the government can provide some incentives to private sector if they realize that at the end it's their own responsibility and no one will come from abroad to help or to invest as they, they are waiting and expecting. Uh, could be related to the quality of service provided by each one. Uh, I think also the government needs to help uh, they are. They have. To, there is tough regulations on on fees, on curricula, on uh, uh, on everything. But what's what's really missing is uh, uh, more transparency to to local investors in terms of changing regulations. The rules is there, but with every incident, situ or devaluation, complaints, things change. Uh, uh, there are some. 
uh, extensive regulations like the government in, can, can put the schools under its direct supervision or management, but I think this is required given the current status of the market, potentially in the future I hope to see this removed or the threats of this because it's important to, for, for investors to work while they are not, they are feeling a balance of power with the regulator and more support rather than fear of, of, of punishment always. Uh, Brilliant, thank you very much. Gary, can you maybe share some experiences from your side of the table? Uh, yeah, I, I think you will see more international operators come into the region. We're seeing it already. There's enormous, there's basically a queue of people formed at the Saudi border for when they, uh, for when they deregulate things over there and also um, one, of the, one of the big problems in the Gulf is that um, if you want to run a school, you've got to have reasonably fancy facilities um, if you're going to charge very high fees and um, there's extremely draconian restrictions on ownership and even long-term leasing of land in most of the Gulf countries, which makes it really hard. But I, I think what will happen, my, my personal opinion is that um, we're seeing international global brands basically um, pr proliferate everywhere. So all coffee shops used to be family owned. Now we have a Starbucks moving in on every corner. And, and I think that will happen to some extent. I think global educational brands will come. And I think what will happen is you'll get a hotel mo management model, you know, like the Ritz-Carlton operating this hotel, but someone else owning it. Um, and. Uh, and that's basically the model that will develop. Um, I think that um, a harbinger of things to come was actually last week, I understand the Egyptian government signed an MOU uh, with the UK and with Germany to basically allow branches of leading universities from those countries to operate here. So there's obviously an active government policy to bring those sort of global brand names into the educational market here at the tertiary sector level. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, I'm mindful of the time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask the, the panel one more question, then I'll see if there's some question from your side. Now, I think we've made the case quite eloquently for why it's an attractive sector, why we are expecting, with varying degrees of optimism, activity to increase in the sector. I'm keen to hear a little bit about the downside. What, could, what, could, what would have to happen to stop this investment from coming through? Are there any challenges that investors need to be mindful of, be cautious of, take into account before they make that commitment? Jeremy, do you want to maybe share your insight first? I'm going to borrow Gary's mic, and I'm not going to take anything personally because I suspect somebody might have switched me off. <laughs> so, um, as I said earlier on, um, if I characterize the market as attractive as opposed to burning hot, then clearly there are challenges, right? So what are the challenges? And let me also say one thing to Gary's point. No matter what anybody can say, the best players in the region in both healthcare and education are homegrown brands, right? So whilst we have interest, that's not what the market needs. What it needs is good operators who know what they're doing and are familiar with their market and can scale. So what are the issues? You know, issue number one clearly is regulation. Uh, in education, the curriculum is something that is considered to be part of a public policy agenda. And that's one of the reasons why there are limitations of the growth of K-12, especially in Asia, right? Vietnam has only recently allowed private schools to accommodate 50% of their enrollment with Vietnamese nationals, even in Singapore. A Singaporean national needs to get permission from the ministry to go to an international school. We tend not to have any of those restrictions in the Middle East and Africa. So any change in regulation could be adverse. To Gary's point, actually, positive change in regulation will spur growth. So if this idea of an infrastructure mentality towards a school changes, right? I'm a parent, I have four children you evaluate the quality of your child's education every day at dinner. You don't really care how big the swimming pool is. What happens in the classroom matters more than anything else, to Muhammad's point. And some of the inhibitor to new ways of delivering both healthcare and education is actually regulatory burden. The reality is when you read all these press reports that extrapolate the number of beds that have to be created in Saudi or in Egypt, or the number of new schools, Honestly, even if that capital was there, the land isn't, right? And access to that land is a very difficult challenge across all of these markets. I think once the regulators partner with operators 
and allow innovative ways of delivering outcomes which aren't focused on the infrastructure that will create opportunity. The converse to that is if they don't, it limits opportunity as well. Uh, the last thing, and this is to Mohammed's point, if you change your mindset from an infrastructure mindset to a services mindset, human to human interaction, actually the biggest challenge you have is the supply chain of people. And if you look at it across all healthcare and education, at a certain point, it's going to be increasingly more difficult to hire the right physicians, the right nurses, the right teachers, the right heads of schools. And we don't really have a, a particularly effective way of taking people within the region and moving them into those workforces. So let me use an example. If you take the UAE, for example, it's very hard to get a physician license if you haven't had very specific things uh, that qualify you for that license. X number of years of service, you know, a degree from such and such a place, and so on. Um, hospitals in the region really struggle with finding good professionals. Um, we recently did some work in Serbia. Serbia has an exceptional healthcare academic system, but 80 to 90 percent of physicians who graduate out of their universities go to Germany. Why? Because they make six times more money. Now, when they go to Germany, they have the unfortunate requirement of having to learn German, which in and of itself is a challenge. But once they invest the time to do that, they stay there. Now, in theory, providers here can tap into sources like that, where you have a much higher, let's say, consistency of a labor pool and integrate that into your model, either by creating a career model for the people who are in your business or finding a way to find them more cost effectively. I think a lot of investors particularly have just focused on putting the building together. Uh, but the resilience in your labor and skill supply chain is, is definitely a big risk. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Gary and Mahmoud, maybe a few comments from your side about the challenges that investors might be facing. Uh, I want to comment on, on this. Uh, people taking care more of buildings. This is a very good example to what happened in the pharma sector in Egypt over the past years. We have now 115 companies. Uh, producing pharma while like 70% of the market is controlled by the 20, uh, the top 20 companies. So most of the other companies were built, were built to be sold, but actually they have built it in a way and GMP standards which does not qualify for any foreign buyers to buy them. And they still working on registrations of drugs which is not being sold and all, all what they are hoping for is they will sell those companies and make fortunes while I think most of those companies at the end will, will disappear or people will buy only the products and leave the manufacturing facilities and I have seen examples of this happening. People who have built factories and at the end people came to them to buy only the products and they say we don't want leave it to you, we'll pay the full value but we don't want the employees, we don't want this uh, manufacturing facility. So uh, even in healthcare I think uh, there is a lot of focus on, on, on buildings, on machines while people are totally underestimating the quality which is for, for in my opinion for especially for private equity investors and for financial investors is a very important factor when you are exiting. If you want to include strategics who know what to do and they have standards and they have long experience, they, they will know it in the first five minutes that this uh, hospital or this manufacturing facility or this lab uh, cannot operate. But some of them is, are making money but wh when you are selling to a strategic, uh, they don't only look to EBITDA. They don't care. They will make the EBITDA. Yes, it's important, uh, but uh, also they look for a long, long term. Thank you very much, Gary. A few words from your side, please. Uh, yeah, I think there's, uh, there's, there's quite a few key risks that investors run. Um, and the big, the big picture risks are the ones that uh, Jeremy already adverted to, which is that if the regulatory burden doesn't 
reduce or if the re regulatory burden goes the wrong way and increases, they're, they're the, the big global risk to the industry. When you look at particular cases and what goes wrong, in the educational sector, our experience has been the problems have usually come because there's, um, you have to, because of the ownership laws have a partnership with the local and, and, and the partner proves to be a bad partner in terms of not meeting commitments or, 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 or sort of not, not being able to, uh, or, or interfering in the business and they're, they're, that's a, a major problem. In the healthcare industry, I think there's two issues particularly um, that you have to be careful of. One is that a lot of um, healthcare assets like hospitals and clinics depend a lot on a number of key medical staff, you know, the uh, directors and people like that. And, and you're very exposed to losing those people and having them go off to competitors. So we always tell people, make sure you stitch up the service contracts with those guys before you actually move ahead and buy anything. Uh, and also, in cert I don't know about here, but in the Gulf, there's an awful lot of under-the-counter payments that are made to work referrers that, that people aren't aware of when they buy into the businesses, but it certainly has an impact. The regulators are really trying to stop that, but the, the practice remains, uh, remains prevalent. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mohammed. final words from your side. What keeps you up at night? What's going to stop you from growing even bigger? I mean, I, I kind of agree with all of these issues, but I think all of them are actually workable within the region and still there's space to work around them and go forward. Uh, but the main thing I think that most of operators and investors are not very focused on these days, what keeps me up at night, is the changing role of education in the next 10 years. The idea of ed tech is becoming crazy. And uh, if every single operator now needs to think of an era where a school or a university is gonna change from a direct service center into what we call it a community access hub. And you see what's happening. Like we have opened a, a very small fund almost four or five years ago in which we started investing in a lot of the startups within the ed sector. So you're getting a lot of crazy things. I mean, you see some of these startups are basically accessing now thousands and thousands of kids in month. Uh, extra aid, support programs. Even we just invested in a company that's actually using Alexa instead of teacher support. So in, in a room, where you're actually supposed to have one teacher and one teacher support and one matron, you actually just have one teacher and a small Alexa where you can actually even access a group of students and tell them, Alexa, solve this equation for the lagging, probably five students at the back, and it would do that. So, so the ed tech is changing like crazy, and I think it's not gonna abolish education, but if you're not cognitive of it, in the next 10 years, you're gonna become the elephant out of the room, and somebody else is gonna take charge, specifically with high ed now. You know, like it, this year, just Harvard just announced that people actually accessed Harvard online programs are much larger than the number of students in-house. And, and that's where the industry is actually developing. So we're talking about one of the most reputable education institutions where it always led the classic mainstream way of education. They're changing and everyone is changing. So unless operators start investing in this now and prepare for it, it's going to be a big risk going forward reeling from the thought that Alexa is solving problems for children in classes, but that's just me. Anyway, thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing your insight. I'd like to see if there are some questions from the audience. There's a, uh, Hannah, would you mind, there's a gentleman right here at the table there, if you mind standing up or lifting your hand again so Hannah can see where she's going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That was a, a fabulous panel and, and very well moderated, Catherine, if I may say. I have a question that is aimed at trying to tie some of the things that you've put together. So I'm, I'm Raj Panasar. I'm a partner at Cleary Gottlieb, and um, we act for the Varki Group. So GEMS is a, a group that's very, very close to our hearts. Now, if you were going to put together an equity story, a compelling equity story for a company like GEMS, if there were three, two or three tenets of that equity story, what would they be? Um, and just, just going to Mohammed's point, I just, just want to follow up on that. That, that, that point about the digital development in, in education, I think it's huge, and I was so glad that you mentioned it um, at, at the end. Now, if, the, 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 if you could tie that in as well to any equity story and how that would work, that would be extremely, extremely helpful. Thank you. Jeremy, do you want to take that one? I think that calls for you. 
I would, I would love to feel that question. Thanks for that question. See, I think, um, so, so you use GEMS as an example. Um, the equity story for a family-owned business, which has no exit aspirations, is very different than a private equity-owned business who has equity uh, exit aspirations. So if I think about the way the first order works, is create resilience. The equity story is about its defensiveness, the big moat that you create around your business, and call it permanent capital. What we're seeing today is the uh, development of hybrid investors, right, who are not focused on exit aspirations. So I look at Inspired Education out of the UK as an example of this, and Mohammed and I were speaking about this earlier on. If you have LPs who are permanent, then you deploy capital in a way that meets that permanency, as opposed to aspiring to exit at some sort of uh, multiple. If the aspiration is exit-oriented, then your traditional K-12 business doesn't really lend itself particularly well to a knocking the ball out of the park, as they say. And that's when you have to diversify into uh, areas which are less capital-intensive, like digital education. I agree with Mohammed 100%. Uh, and actually, the markets reflect that. If you look at valuations for edtech businesses, they're 40 to 60 times, right? As opposed to 22 times, which is very good for a K-12 business. Nord was trading on, on the New York Stock Exchange 23 times. Uh, recent transactions are actually anywhere from 12 to 25 times. It doesn't go much higher than that. So I think uh, the answer to your question on how to build an equity story is, what kind of equity story do you want to build? Do the other gentlemen want to add something to that? Mohammed, maybe you that. Yeah, uh, on your question on, on, on the ad tech, I mean, definitely it's gonna change the way you invest. I mean, li like six months ago, I actually spent a trial in which we, um, a group of investors spent the whole day in a school in which there was not a single teacher. It was all holograms. So every single classroom, they were divided by subjects, and in the classroom you enter, you access with your hand, you get, it puts you in, and then a hologram would appear and start going over the lesson. I, I, like, I'm, I'm sitting here on a panel and my daughter keeps messaging me. She's at the exam and she needs her verification codes to enter. I mean, that's where the education is actually moving. And I think the investment going forward should not be only focused on how many schools are we going to build, no. What is the infrastructure? What, what is the learning management system? What's the interface? How are we going to integrate technology? And how can you access students beyond uh, uh, the school? I mean, we, we have one school that we started a program in Egypt in which by now we have 300 in-house students, but we have 600 online. And it's crazy. I mean, it's our first year, it's our first trial. The numbers are excessive. A lot of people are even now choosing homeschooling, online access, blended learning formats. So the whole world even is, is, is becoming a bit anti-technology. Look like... The, what is the most popular school now if you go to California? It's alt school. What's alt school? It's three days in school, two days you study at home, and you work through an interface. So, it, it, so the new era is even the interest of the public is, you know, I don't see my kids going to school every day. Probably they need to learn other skills or do it differently. So, and, and I think that's where the equity discussion needs to happen. Wow, I'm still a bit shell-shocked by that experience. I have two small children that have just started school, so th the thought of them going to a school and no teacher being there, that frightens the living daylight out of me, but maybe I'm the wrong audience <laughs> that. Anyway, let's see if there's some other questions here. There's a gentleman over here. So my name is Muhab, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I see Mr. Muhammad is um, very optimistic when it comes to the Egyptian market, mentioning the big market size, two million people in kindergarten and 800,000 in... Uh, Grade 12, I have to disagree, and I do have two questions. Uh, first of all, um, the market size, yes, it's very big, but uh, if we looked at uh, analyzing the numbers, international schools and private schools are around 1% or something of the Egyptian market, as far as I remember from a presentation done by the Egyptian education minister. Uh, that's first of all. So is it really an attractive market away from the Yes, we are a very populous country. We, we are a lot. We're 104 million. But how much there is a window of opportunity really to invest in education in Egypt? Uh, the other part of the question is regarding the reforms in the education and healthcare. Um, there are now a reform program done by the Ministry of Education and another one done by Ministry of uh, uh, Health. Uh, there is a new health insurance uh, law that 
will be uh, um, implemented in the next 15 years as far as I remember there is a new reforms in education also regarding government schools reforming government schools and there are new restrictions are being put on private schools and international schools in Egypt which hasn't been done before so uh, my question is again about the attractiveness of the market regarding investment in education and in healthcare thank you To correct the figures, because I know you're slightly talking about they always miss a zero in it, and I told them before. So <laughs> actually, it's 10 percent, the size of the private sector in K to 12. Uh, but the ministry keeps putting this zero off the uh, slide. But anyways, so it's 10 percent on K to 12, and it's 5 percent on high ed. Uh, the government announced that actually it's, it wants to focus on mainstreaming public education, uh, and essentially this entails them going back to 80 percent and allowing another 10 percent growth. So I mean. Effectively, the vision of Egypt that the private sector would double its size, stay at the global averages of 20%, and at the same time, the government will try to improve the public education. Because the public education, you know, about, it's, it's way out of even accessibility. So it's, it's a very different ball game. So yes, the numbers would actually support. So the, the sector is not only growing, it's doubling in terms of size. So that answer on the demographic point. The other point about the regulation, no, it's actually misunderstood, and I'll tell you something. If, if you, the regulation in Egypt of K-12 was, was done by something called Decision uh, 303 or 303 before, which was very strict, actually even more strict than now, because it used to allow you to only grow by 7% in terms of going forward and allowed a lot of restrictions on activities and other angles to be done. The new one, the 420, actually allow you to grow, if you're in the middle division, up to 10%, and it allows the school to do a lot of extracurricular activities to generate revenue going forward. So the regulation is actually easing rather than being tightened. Egypt have one of the most regulated education sectors in the whole region. It goes into every single detail, uh, un unlike what you see, for example, in UAE, where they started now looking at regulation or in Saudi and other areas. So the good news, it's highly regulated and it's easing up. But as I said, the, the challenge is massive. Look at the numbers. I mean, they just we want to build 260,000 classrooms. If somebody would come tomorrow and tell them we're going to take 10,000 off your back, they're going to be very thankful for it because that's, that's a huge demand. I mean, to the extent that the president said, I'm not going to increase public increase this year because I need the money to build more schools. So, I mean, that must be a very drastic decision to go this way. So, all private sector is actually welcome within the sector. And we need to tell them again to correct the zero. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Now, I feel awful because I've been told that I need to wrap things up now because there's a networking coffee break afterwards. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for giving all your time and insight and sharing it with the audience. Thank you very much for your questions. I hope you've enjoyed the panel. The panelists will be outside having coffee, so if you have any extra questions, please make use of them. Thank you so much. Thank you.